Senator from Iowa. I come to the floor to bring up the point that there must be equal attention to the dangers of extremism, whether it's extremism of the right or extremism of the left. We've all been horrified by the senseless criminal acts that occurred at the state capitol January 6th this year. A violent mob was able to overrun Capitol Police and quickly gain access to the area where a joint session of Congress was being held. Five people, including a Capitol Police officer, died as a result of this attack. I hope that together, Republicans and Democrats, we can get to the bottom of what occurred on that day and ensure that it never happens again. In the spirit of collaboration, I must direct everyone's attention to something that has occurred to me, and that is the need to condemn all political violence regardless of ideology. Like many Americans, I've been deeply troubled by the rioting, looting, anti-police attacks, and deaths that have occurred this summer. While many very legitimately protested the death of George Floyd in a peaceful manner consistent with their rights, consistent with their rights under the First Amendment, thousands of others did not do it in a peaceful manner and probably did it for a lot of other reasons than just because of George Floyd's death. One of the most upsetting aspects of the violence of this summer has been how it has targeted innocent law enforcement officers. Over 700 officers were injured between May 27th and June 8th, 2020. This number is likely underreported, as nearly 300 of those injuries occurred only in New York City. Acting Deputy Homeland Security Secretary Ken Cuccinelli testified at a hearing in front of the Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution that there had been 277 federal officers in injuries at the federal courthouse in Portland, adding further to that total previously given to you. Officers were assaulted nightly there, and there for months, slashed, hard objects thrown at them, struck with art objects like hammers and baseball bats, even blinded by lasers. In another offensive, 60 Secret Service officers were injured during a sustained attack on the White House, which caused then President Trump to be brought into a secure bunker. The church across the street from the White House was lit on fire as a part of that continued assault. Over 300 people were charged federally for their roles in these weeks and months of violence. 80 of those charges related to the use of arson and explosives. Others involved assaults on officers and destruction of government property. However, the nationwide riots, which broke out in nearly every major city in the country, were predominantly state offenses. At least 14,000 people were arrested in 49 cities. At least 25 people died in violence related to the riots. Property Claim Services, a company that tracks insurance claims relating to riots and civil disorder, estimated that the insurance losses from the summer's civil unrest far outstrip all previous records to possibly exceed $2 billion. It has been a relatively frequent sight at the summer's 
violent events, to see individuals acting in coordination in all black bloc holding the A symbol of Antifa, an admitted Antifa adherent in Portland murdered a conservative protester. Antifa supporters have been charged federally for promoting riots and using Molotov cocktails. While that violence has slackened now, after President Biden's electoral victory was declared, it has far from abated. Antifa rioters attacked Oregon Democratic Party headquarters on Inauguration Day itself. The far left of this country continues to believe violence will get more attention for their causes even after a Democratic victory win for the White House. Much of the violence of the summer was specifically investigated by the FBI as domestic terrorism. FBI Director Chris Wray provides statistics on domestic terrorism in his annual threats testimony. He has previously testified that 900 to 1,000 domestic terrorism investigations exist at any given time. There are also about 1,000 what they call homegrown violent extremism investigations. These are cases in which an entirely U.S.-based person without direct contact with a foreign terrorist organization is motivated by global jihadist movement. And of course, there are thousands more international terrorism investigations. Former U.S. Attorney Aaron Neely Cox testified in a subcommittee hearing that over 300 domestic terrorism cases were opened due to the violence just this past summer. This is a significant increase in the ordinary amount of domestic terrorism in the United States. That this violence occurred, the facts and the figures that surround it should not be news to anyone. However, I must admit that I've been extremely surprised by the responses of uh, Democratic members to this violence. For weeks and months, the most consistent response seemed to be to deny the violence was occurring at all. I saw Chair Chairman Gerald Nadler on TV, Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, denied that Antifa itself was real. In a nationally televised debate with then President Trump, then candidate, Joe Biden strong, wrongly stated that Antifa is only, quote unquote, an idea. This is even after FBI Director Ray had already testified to Congress that Antifa was absolutely, quote unquote, a real thing, and that the FBI had cases and investigations against those calling themselves Antifa. It seems that some Democrats are living in a different world than those who have seen businesses boarded up, if not burned out, images of violence in the streets and terrifying attacks on police officers. When the violence was admitted by those same people, it seemed to have been condoned rather than condemned. Now Vice President Harris previously said, quote, they're not going to stop. And everyone, beware. And they should not. And we should not, end of quote. You've seen that quote many times on various TV channels. Our new vice president did not disclaim the rioting and unrest and direct her followers only to lawful action. Congresswoman Presley stated, quote, 
There needs to be unrest in the streets for as long as there is an unrest in our lives, end of quote. Speaker Pelosi famously ever famously said on the widespread property damage that you saw when asked about it, she was quoted as saying, people will do what they will what they do. A direct quote from her, and you've seen that many times on television. Now, that indifference that seems to be expressed in those and a lot of other quotations we could give to the violence that our constituents were enduring was dramatically shattered when a violent riot came to this building itself. After that event, many members of Congress asked why a more militarized, more militarized force had not protected them from a group of then President Trump supporters who turned violent. Police officers were again considered heroes and protectors. Unlike last summer, when they were attacked, the presence, of na the presence of National Guard members was all of a sudden welcome rather than decried, unlike last summer in cities like Portland and Seattle, where mayors condemned maybe the president or the federal government generally for interfering and trying to bring peace to those cities. Many of the people of this country would like to have such resources available to them to ensure their safety. Like every weekend in Chicago, when there's dozens of people hurt by shootings and a lot of people killed in that same weekend. Since the day of the attack on the Capitol, I have heard much of a renewed focus among my Democratic colleagues on combating domestic terrorism and political violence. And there's nothing wrong with combating domestic terrorism and political violence. And that's why my first words today was, there needs to be equal attention to the danger of terrorism, whether it's of the left or of the right. And as I indicated in my words just stated, this is very much welcome. Any attention we can give to domestic terrorism and political violence. And I hope that we will be able to work together to keep Americans safe. However, any work that we do in this area must be focused on preventing violence, no matter what ideology is given to justify that violence. In fact, in a recent Department of Homeland Security bulletin, that bulletin noted the breadth of potential threats that we may be facing after the Capitol riot including domestic violent extremists, quote, moted by a range of issues, including anger, COVID-19 restrictions, and 2020 election results, and police use of force, as well as racial and ethnic tensions, and homegrown violent extremists inspired by foreign terrorists and groups, end of quote. The response that I've seen to the Capitol riot here in Congress has not given me hope that we're in agreement about combating this broad range of threats in the spirit of giving equal attention to the dangers 
of domestic terrorism or any kind of violation of law, whether it comes from the right or the left. I've seen that many Democratic members of Congress seem to be discussing the need to combat white supremacism, su supremacism with reference to the Capitol riot. And I'm not going to find fault with anybody that talks about any race of any kind thinking they're supreme to anybody else, because we're all individuals that God loves. And if we were to return that love, we wouldn't have a lot of problems in this country. We must absolutely combat white supremacism wherever it occurs. And we have a responsibility to understand the true factors that led to the attack on this building. I hope to learn more from law enforcement over the coming weeks and months about what the involvement of white supremacists or any other extremists was in this attack. However, I'm concerned that the use of the term may have a different purpose to try to portray any supporters of former President Trump who garnered over 74 million votes in the most recent election as white supremacists. Congresswoman Cori Bush stated on the House floor that former President Trump was, quote, a white supremacist president who incited a white supremacist insurrection, end of quote. I hope everyone can agree that such rhetorical and inaccurate characterizations are dangerous. More concerning seems to be the idea that violence committed by the far left or for left-leaning ideologies is in some way tolerable because of the left's assessment that the purpose of all that violence is somehow noble. However, right-leaning thought, whether accompanied by violence or not, is considered terrorist. Former CIA Director John Brennan, whose credibility has been questioned, raised incoming, praised incoming President Biden's inaugural with reference to defeating quote unquote white supremacy and likewise libertarians to quote religious extremists, authoritarians, fascists, bigots, racists, nativists, end of quote. It's hard to see how libertarian libertarian philosophy, political philosophy, a mainstream conservative political ideology, which is scarcely in any way associated with violence, is related to the other terms that Mr. Brennan lists. Unless, of course, Mr. Brennan is simply referring to religious Americans as religious extremists, or those who believe in the rule of law rather than Antifa rioting as authoritarians and fascists, or those who believe in having a functioning immigration system as somehow they seem to be bigots or racists or nativists. In short, these are all terms that are applied regularly and unfairly to conservative Americans using peaceful means to argue for their ideas of religious freedom, law and order, and secure borders, and probably a lot of other things that they argue for. Congresswoman Jackie Spears was even more direct in a tweet suggesting that all Republicans be labeled terrorists. 
As a body, we may begin looking into domestic terrorism more generally. I look forward to so doing. I'm sure all members will share my commitment that the focus of our inquiries should be all uh, beyond all of the politically motivated violence we've seen in this country and not somehow just a subset of that politically motivated violence. The men and women of this nation who have been affected by Antifa and other left-wing extremists are entitled to much more than a cursory acknowledgement of that fact. Likewise, I hope no part of our effort will focus on demonizing the peaceful expression of ideas with which Democratic members disagree. I will be sharing the ideas that I have on this subject and these concerns that I've stated today directly with my friend, the incoming Senate Judiciary Chairman, Senator Durbin. He'll get a letter from me, and I look forward to working with Senator Durbin on the path forward. 